Let's get the thoughts of the presidential historian, Dr Laura Ellen-Smith. Nice to see you on the programme. Uh, thank you for your time today. I know it's a little earlier where you are. So, uh, no surprises coming out fighting. You wouldn't expect anything else, would you? No, not really. This is very much in keeping with his character. I think a lot has been said in terms of legal scholarship, saying that anyone else facing such serious charges will be looking for a plea. But no one is surprised that Donald Trump is certainly not countenancing that at the moment. Is he wounded by all these various charges? They've got to hit him, haven't they? Well, that's the ultimate question, uh, is whether it's going to really ignite a base that he's very reliant upon or whether it's actually going to force people uh, to reconsider. I think most people would say that if this is a second indictment, it's not going to change minds. If people's minds weren't changed by the first, they're not going to be changed by the second. But the Republican Party is facing a real challenge in the sense that the 2022 midterms demonstrated that the base, the evangelical base that they rely on to get out the vote, people who are normally pro-life, are now starting to waver considering the Dobbs decision. So they're looking to see, OK, how do we get out the vote? And if Donald Trump could do that in the sense of being able to say he's part of a witch hunt in charges that aren't very relatable, particularly for a traditional conservative Republican base, you know, normally very pro-military. These are not very relatable charges in terms of someone keeping classified documents and national secrets exposed. Uh, so it's a question as to whether he can rally the base he's relied on, whether it's going to change minds, probably not, or whether it's actually going to keep people away from the polls. Uh, he says he was justified having these, uh, quoting what is referred to as the Presidential Records Act. Uh, does such a thing exist? Well, <laughs> yes, but the way that Donald Trump has characterised it in terms of the past, he said, oh, well, as president, I have the all power, almost godlike, to be able to say, oh, well, that's going to be declassified, uh, and just with a blink of an eye, it is. It's certainly not true. Um, and so I think the nonchalant approach that he has taken uh, toward uh, national and classified top secret documents is very concerning. And, that, and that's not just in circles, in democratic circles, it's in broader circles as well. Yeah, having some stuff in, what, the ballroom in his bathroom seems a bit surprising, doesn't it? Well, yes, I, I would be concerned with anyone needing that much reading material in the bathroom, but um, certainly to have the public access is very concerning. The amount of people who go in and out of that ballroom, hundreds of thousands of people with special events. Uh, and and it's, what was really interesting is that these charges, 37 criminal counts, have been able to be filed simply because the people he has hired and worked with at Mar-a-Lago have had to come forward and say, yes, you know, I saw these documents, I took pictures of these documents, I was aware they were there, I maybe moved these documents and was told to move them. So it's really difficult for him to be able to sort of isolate himself in this situation. Do you think this, the dynamics change here among his support base, the fact that he is facing these new, as we mentioned, 37 federal charges? I, I don't honestly think so. I think if you were pro-Trump before uh, Friday, you're still going to be pro-Trump. Um, you are liable to sort of see it as, uh, you know, oh, yes, OK, this, this is another witch hunt in terms of concerns over the reach and scope of the federal government. That's very traditional conservative uh, concerns and ideology there. Um, but whether this particular case, in terms of its linkage to uh, military national security concerns, has a bit more resonance than, say, for example, maybe more concerns are more relatable things like, for example, um, concerns over witch hunts that he has called in terms of related to the Me Too movement or anything like that, um, like the Gene Carroll case. Uh, these, these are cases that are maybe more relatable to his base in a way that this case certainly is very unique to him. Well, when we talk about the Republican nominations and mm -hmm. obviously the race for the White House next year, he's still the, the, the favourite, is he not? I and mean, we've got Ron DeSantis there. We've even got Mike Pence now, haven't we? His uh, uh, former uh, vice president. How is the race uh, itself looking? Well, for the, the Republican nomination. Messy. I <laughs> think it would be the one word that you'd have to say. Uh, you've got a lot of Republicans thinking that they can make a lane for themselves. You know, you've got people from traditionally conservative states like Asa Hutchinson, governor of Arkansas, um, thinking that they can make a lane for a never Trump almost or never Trumper again. Um, you've got people like uh, Nikki Haley, obviously, who also worked in the Trump administration as UN ambassador. Um, you've got people like Chris Christie, who was once again very close to Trump at one point in time, certainly not or saying not anymore. 
Um, so you have these very convoluted past relationships with these very complex figures, all trying to make a lane for themselves, whether they can be heard above the noise that is Donald Trump. And uh, in terms of the time frame of how this is going to unfold with all his legal troubles, that's yet to be seen. What is it about Donald Trump that evokes such emotion and support by his fan base? I think he speaks to a lot of concerns that are based on, uh, unfortunately, a, a, lot, a lot of concerns in terms of changing economy, in terms of this idea of uh, people perhaps a sense of needing a university education in order to get a job that perhaps generations before, for example, if you're a coal family in West Virginia, you could rely on. So. You know, we saw in 2016 this breaking of the supposed blue wall from voters who are really frustrated at the Democratic Party, who felt left behind and who felt that Donald Trump um, spoke to them in a way that perhaps even Bernie Sanders did. But of course, if Bernie Sanders didn't get the nomination, they went for Trump um, and thought that here's someone who's not a politician, who, despite, uh, you know, he may have uh, millions of dollars to his name, is relatable, is someone who I could have a beer with, is someone who sees the fact that I may be uh, at a disadvantage uh, in a way, and this goes, speaks obviously to white male privilege as well, in a way that um, ha has never been seen in the same way before. Because you're, some people are looking at, you know, polling saying that, okay, 2050, maybe whites could be in a minority due to immigration and demographic changes in the US. And that does scare uh, a certain segment of the white male population in particular, um, in terms of status, in terms of economic and social and cultural issues. So All right, well, well, we'll have to leave it there. There's plenty to chew over. We'll have a lot more time, won't we? We'll see if this uh, crowded field uh, reduces uh, in time. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you.